All right, and we're live on both. All right. Plus, you had my house. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Shelley from Spoy Health Radio, Spoy's Wednesday Wellness Minutes. And uh, we're trusting you can hear us because we're trying out some new mics today. We've got these new fancy uh, wireless mics that are Bluetooth powered, and hopefully you're not going to have any audio issues. If you do, please feel free to just make a comment below, and we'll just disconnect the silly things and move on with life. But uh, basically, what we, you see the title of the post today, it's about trauma, right? Um, are you going to be a victim or a survivor after that trauma? It just depends on how you want to approach it. Now, uh, this this segment is you know clearly not designed to make anyone feel like we're dismissing their trauma or minimizing their trauma or anything like that. So please just listen with an open mind. We're just trying to provide you know helpful information to people to process things. Um, so yeah, there's no really way. Uh, if you receive this in a way that's less than supportive and loving, then uh, you're probably not re receptive to too many messages. Uh, but at the same time, we're doing this with the best of intentions as far as getting people some information about how to process trauma and things like that. Um, so like the, the phasing of trauma, there's just different phases, right? And that, that happened, like, was initially kind of categorized or um, developed back in the 1800s. I think it was uh, Pierre Jeannette. Uh, it's probably French or some sort. But um, we talked about the, the central framework of trauma is really... Um, feelings of helplessness and lack of control, lack of power, uh, isolation, because you feel like you're alone, you feel like no one understands what you're dealing with, um, you're afraid to talk to anybody because it's embarrassing, and um, you feel powerless, you feel like you have no voice, and things like that. So a lot of different things can go through the trauma. Now trauma can take many forms. It can be physical trauma, you can be assaulted by someone, it can be a sexual trauma, uh, a rape, or um, sexual abuse or sexual advance by someone, that's a trauma. Um, you could have a trauma from something exploding near you, you could have a trauma from a family member dying or seeing someone else be injured. There, there's a lot of different ways you can be traumatized. So uh, you may have a personal experience for yourself. Uh, the one most uh, prevalent to me, having, having seen someone go through it, was watching my wife Sarah suffer after losing her sister unexpectedly when her sister was giving childbirth. And to watch that process, that was absolutely eye-opening, humbling, and and uh, education, to say the least, to, to watch her struggle through that and watch her process all the different emotions and the, the anger, the rage, the, the denial, the, the, all the different things. It sort of like a mourning process. We talked about, I think it was last week on Wednesday when I was minutes, talking about how do you process loss, or either the anticipation of loss or basically the sudden loss of someone or something or something in your life. Um, so whether you're feeling hopeless or loss of power, um, loss of control or isolation. It just depends on where you're at and how that's affected you. And our hope with this segment is to provide you a different way of framing things. Uh, and it will not be received by everyone, certainly, because not everyone is ready to hear that kind of information. Other people may say it's callous, other people may say it's this and that. It's not really about how it's received, it's the intent of, of providing information. It's really about helping you feel empowered and strong and confident and taking on your world. So. Um, one of the first phases that Jeanette talks about is like this phases of uh, safety and stabilization. So when you've been traumatized, oftentimes you can feel unsafe. You can feel like you're uncertain about your environment, you're uncertain about yourself, you're uncertain about the people in your life, and it can feel unsafe. So the need to feel safe is probably the primary thing. Um, so we'll take the example of someone who's been sexually assaulted, you know, fearing someone finding out about it, having a self evident conflict, and now saying there's something wrong with me, I'm flawed because I've been assaulted. Or um, I'm, I'm embarrassed about talking about it because people tend to second guess themselves whether they're male or female getting sexually abused. It's about uh, second guessing yourself and saying, you know, did I do something to contribute to it? Did I cause it? Things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of confusing emotions related to that. Um, people tend to go towards soothing behaviors uh, because it's so painful and it's hard to deal with. We tend to try to sedate things, and that could be drugs, alcohol, sex. Uh, it can be um, cigarettes. It can be food. Um, music, anything, isolation. There's a lot of different things we can use to soothe ourselves. That's that's part of the safety and and, uh, and uh, stabilization phase because we're trying to find a way to get our equilibrium back. Like you've been sort of walking along and someone just hit you and you get dinged and emotionally and, and neurologically you're just kind of thrown off. Um, so learning how to regulate those emotions is really important because your emotional scales have been tipped it from one way or the other, depending on which way you went with it, it's going to be hard to, at first, you know, to even talk about it. Speaking might be tough. So what we describe, or specifically myself, is if 
you don't like an emotion in your body, create motion in your body. Because you can control your physiology by controlling your physiology. So, um, your, so your psychology can control by your physiology, your emotional state can be controlled by your physiology. So change your physical state, whether that's pumping your fist, screaming out loud, jumping up and down, doing some burpees, pumping out some push-ups, sit-ups, whatever you gotta do to change your physiology, you can disrupt an emotion in a second. Because an emotion is basically a chemical reaction in your brain. And when you can disrupt that emotion, by using motion in your body, you can short circuit things, whether it's a, uh, sadness and anxiety, um, depression, all kinds of anger and rage. You can change your physiology and change your neuroemotional state instantaneously by changing your physical state. So use that as a tool. It's really important you can use that as a tool. Especially when it's not you're not able to convey that emotion and tell you say, explain how you're feeling. Like only seven percent of our communication is the words out of my mouth right now. Um, I'm a very um, visual person, I act things out. I think of things in pictures and movies and stuff like that. If you spend any time with me, I usually recite some type of movie line or some type of quote because that's what my, my brain works in pictures and, and you'll have to excuse me, that's why I talk so fast because my brain is very visual and, and I articulate things in a very fast manner and I know I get criticism all the time. I gotta slow down, you're talking too fast, too, too, big, of, too big of words and stuff like that. It's really tough. Like, I wish I were real, you know, what's called a kinesthetic person, be like, yeah, you know, Today we're going to talk about processing traumas, and you know that that's not my jam. That's not how I roll. I, I try to curtail my behavior to help everybody understand it, but just understand, just turn the speed down, okay? Uh, but whether you're processing emotion physically, verbally, consciously, psychologically, you just got to get it out, okay? Don't let it get trapped in your body because that's where disease happens. It becomes um, trapped emotions get trapped in tissues which start creating density in tissue and you have dis-ease and then it turns into disease, right? So that's kind of the process your body goes through. Use meditation and breathing, right? Amelia, my teammate here with me, she's a certified breath coach. Right? She could teach you how to breathe, right? In case you forgot. <laughs> um, in the absence of exercise and, you know, doing something rigorously, you should breathe into the belly. You should breathe into the abdomen, right? Sometimes I like to activate my brain and my pineal gland by drawing air up into my head and, and tensing the perineum, the pelvic floor, and, and energizing that part of the brain. So there's different ways of doing it. So it depends on whether you want to calm things down or speed things up. If you want to dial things in or calm things down, it just depends on how you want to access that part of your, your neurology. So meditation, breathing, prayer is great. Um, you know, it really just depends on how you want to process that trauma and how you process those emotions in your body. Most importantly, don't let them get stuck in your body because uh, emotions buried alive stay alive. So always remember, if you bury it, it's going to come back at some point. It's like, a, you know, if you've ever ridden a bike and you heard the hook saying, what goes up must come down. Like you, if you ride up a hill, you got to go downhill. If you go downhill, you got to go back up a hill, something like that, right? If you bury something, you're going to have to deal with it again at some point. That's either in dealing with it consciously and deliberately or having to deal with it later on as a result of it building up a problem in your body. Okay? So don't let emotions get stuck. So the next phase in Jeanette's um, phasing is the, it's called remembrance in the morning, okay? So remembering sort of what happened, if you will, and mooring sort of what you feel like you might have lost in that process. Um, you know, obviously, uh, everybody is well aware if you've looked at the news at all, if you looked at the, the book face or Facebook and Instagram, people are posting, you know, a lot of things about Black Lives Matter and, and Mr. Floyd, who, whose life was senselessly taken um, after, you know, having his neck knelt on for, 10 minutes, whatever this whole story was, right? There's a lot of rage going on, a lot of frustration. People get angry and they get physical because it gives them a sense of confidence again. Because when your confidence is completely knocked down, you become angry as a sort of a pseudo or a fake way of becoming confident again. So what people are doing is in order to get control of their environment, at least their perception of controlling their environment, now they're going out and wreaking havoc on, on businesses and trashing things because it's a, they're a way of expressing their their disgust and their rage and their frustration but it's really psychologically giving them a sense of control again okay so what happened to that man was senseless and we can only hope that at this point some type of legislation is put into place that will agree like uh, you know punish these egregious crimes what we want to understand about racism is that it's a trauma in and of itself racism is a trauma in the gene pool it's, it's an education that children go through as they grow up so instead of legislating this out of our culture, what needs to happen is how we teach our children how to view each other, how to view people of different colors, different races, ethnicities, different physical capabilities, shapes, sizes, whatever it is, right? It's an educational process. Because you look at children playing, and as long as they haven't been indoctrinated into a type of mental thinking process, they will play with a child who's disfigured, they'll play with a child of a different color, a different race, different height, different size, uh, their speaking ability, their physical capabilities, 
children don't care. It's not until adults impregnate their brains and indoctrinate them into a way of thinking that racism actually happens. So racism is a trauma in and of itself. It goes back centuries, um, you know, and it's been going on probably ever since this, the dawn of time, right? Ever since somebody thought they were smarter than another person, they had some type of physical upper hand, and then they, they just started manipulating, okay? So this is not new. Um, Lord knows we have it on Facebook and the news and everywhere now. Uh, it's, you know, the, back in the 60s, basically, people were like, you know, this happened everywhere, but we didn't have the notoriety, but now it's everywhere. And now you can't escape it. So let's start teaching our children how to treat people with respect, no matter who they are, where they come from, class, creed, color, religion, doesn't matter what their sexual orientation is, what persuasion they are, it doesn't matter. It's about us educating our children. And we as educators can help them understand that we are all created equal, we're all acceptable and lovable just the way we are. So just a public service announcement there, just, just stop with the insanity. Nothing's gonna be solved by destruction and rioting and, and violence stuff like that. So teach your children, talk to your children about what racism is. It's a, it's a belief system that someone's less than or someone's different. So just start teaching your family and your friends like that. So I won't get belabor that point anymore, but getting back to the remembrance and mourning stage. Uh, I, I tend to go off on tangents, so I have to excuse me. Um, but I'm a firm believer that you don't want to relive the trauma, right? I don't think there's anything beneficial from reliving a trauma. Now there are systems out there like EMDR and things like that that help you become a third party observer and, and have you be the, the observer of the scene. Like, you know, um, when Sarah started doing EMDR before she got into QNRT, she was taught to, to take a step back and observe herself at the park when they were having a picnic for her work and just observe herself having, you know, hearing the news about Becky passing and, and then, you know, just the, the, the gut-wrenching screams that, that were coming out of her because she was just absolutely, you know, I mean, talk about PTSD. I mean, that, that's as close as I know to PTSD. Um, and so when I saw her later on, you know, seeing someone go from a, a, a bright, vibrant human being to literally a shell of a person that just is literally inconsolable, it's, it's just amazing to see what can happen to the human spirit. And then on the flip side of that, to see what happens when you intervene with something like resetting the brain, rewiring the brain, and, and resetting the trauma out, okay? So for her to go from inconsolable, unable to stop mourning, unable to stop weeping, to someone who can't make themselves cry. And it didn't rob her of the mourning process, but it actually helped her function and process through it, rather than being so overwhelmed with the grief and the deep separation loss that she suffered in that relationship. So, the remembrance of the mourning, I would encourage you not to focus on what happened, but focus on you know the meaning of it. We'll get to that in a second. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, so exploring the mourning process and the loss, right? Like, what does that feel like? What did like what part of you feel like it was stolen? What part of you feel like it was injured? Was it your pride? Was it your your sensuality? Was it your essence? You know, what was what was felt violated? What what is that? What is that? And help you mourn that process, uh, mourn through those emotions and things like that. Explore through it and, and kind of sit with it. I, I suggest you write it out because. When you get it out of your head, you can actually process it better. When it's left in your head, you just rationalize things and you reason through it and you know, oh, it's so bad and it's, it's this and that, the other thing and whatever. There's a lot of different things we can do to, to just dismiss it away. But um, explore it, sit with it. Uh, but in QNRT, we talk about we're gonna find it, we're gonna own it, we're gonna feel it, we're gonna reset it, we're gonna forget it. So when you think about that way, it's like, it's not about processing it over and over. It's not about going through this lengthy mourning process. It's about literally, Identifying the stress trigger in the nervous system, resetting it out of the system so it becomes your wisdom to propel you forward versus your anchor to hold you back. But that's how I envision it. That's how I'm a very visual person. I think about cement boots holding you back, the pain, the mourning, the, the sadness, the grief that's holding you back. Let's, let's take away the boots and let's set it the wisdom to help you help someone else in the future to help you help someone else process their mourning and their, their loss and their trauma and stuff like that. So, uh, moving on to the next stage, that's. Uh, the reconnection and reintegration phase. Now that's that's like getting a new sense of yourself. Like who am I now that I've processed this? Who am I now that I have accepted? Because acceptance is the truest part of mourning and healing and trauma. It's accepting what happened and said, you know what? That is in the past and I can't do anything about that now. You never can change the cards you're dealt in life, but to a certain extent. But what you can do is you change how you process it and what you do about it, okay? So that new, that new sense of self and that new sense of my, what's my future like, okay? So are you gonna take that and you're gonna have that propel you forward, that trauma, you're gonna re propel you forward, but of course your, your, your life is still intact? Is it gonna propel you forward or is it gonna hold you back? And you you have to decide. 
we decide, is this going to propel me forward? Am I, is it going to prepare me for tomorrow? Am I going to be stronger, more resilient, um, able to help people tra- process their traumas? Or is it just going to be this thing that, that burdens me and cripples me for the rest of my life? That could be physical dismem- disfigurement or dismemberment. That could be um, sexual assault, uh, emotional trauma, verbal abuse. Um, it, it comes in all forms, okay? So you can use it to do what's called self-determination living where like I'm determining who I am I'm defining who I am I get to decide my path no matter what happens to me I'm taking control of that okay that's self-determination or self-determining living and when you feel empowered like that like it doesn't matter what he she they did whatever happened to me happened to me and what you choose to do about it is really important okay so what I would encourage you to do is reframe the trauma so if you look back a couple weeks we talked about sort of um positivity versus negativity, and this is sort of uh, building upon that. So, how do you see the incident? What was the trauma? What was it? How do you frame that? What are you seeing it as? Was that the most egregious thing that ever happened to you, or is that the greatest opportunity for you to heal something and help other people with it? Yeah, so how do you see the incident? Um, what meaning are you placing on it? Okay, which is touching on what meaning, when you place the meaning on it, that turn determines your emotion about it. So if it's like, I was violated, I was, um, robbed of this and that, this and that and other thing, that's going to determine your emotions. So how you frame it, whether it be positive or negative, is going to determine how you feel about it, either positive or negative. And so when you choose your emotions and you choose how you frame it, that's going to determine your trajectory, right? So Ziegler said your attitude is going to determine your altitude. So if you choose the negative, if you choose looking down upon it, if you choose um, that's an egregious act and I'm, I'm a victim and this and that, it's going to pull you down all day long for the rest of your life. You'll be fighting that all day long. You might have some good days, but you're going to have a lot of bad days. Um, so yeah, what do you choose to focus on? Was it the act and what happened? Or is it you can choose like, hey, you know what? I'm alive. I've got vital energies. I've got a life to live. I've got a lot of things to offer this world. So what do you choose to focus on? And where are you going to go with it? Is it going to pull you, are you going to lift you up or is it going to pull you down? Okay? So I would encourage you to engage your resilient human spirit. The human spirit, I've seen things happen to people. You know, they can be born without arms and legs and they can motivation speaker. They can be, I forget the girl's name, but she was kidnapped with a child, held in captivity, and then came out. And one of the most powerful things, it was in California, her mother talked to her and said, you know what, honey, we're so glad you're alive now, and now let's make your life mean something rather than, you know, almost saying, a coddling her and saying, oh, you know, you poor thing, and this and that. The mother had the consciousness and the presence of mind to say, this is going to be your opportunity to change the world. Okay, um, so that is an opportunity you can choose to take, but when you reframe and use your human resilient spirit to t- change that, you get to control the course of your life. So you can choose to be a victim or you can choose to be a survivor. You get to choose. And no one's gonna tell you if that's right or wrong. I'm a firm believer that there's no such thing as right or wrong. We should all get rid of the ideas of right or wrong and good and bad, because they don't serve anybody any purpose. When you judge something as right or wrong, then you're putting meaning on it, you're judging it. Good or bad is also judging it. So I try to avoid that conversation with my daughter. Like I try to avoid referring to anything as good or bad, right or wrong, because that's framing her mindset to look at choices as right or wrong, choices as good or bad, what happens in her life, I want her to understand. Like Whatever happens, no matter what, she chooses the meaning of it. She chooses what it does in her, in her life. So you know, for Sophia, I hope that for someday that for her, that means something for her. Um, that's a very conscious effort on me, but I want to encourage you to choose. Are you going to be a survivor or are you going to be a victim? Because you get to choose. It's, it's your life, your path. No one's going to tell you right or wrong. I shouldn't say that. Plenty of people are going to tell you right or wrong. <laughs> people are going to say, that's a great idea. That's a bad idea. That, you know, There's no such thing as right or wrong, good or bad. We, take, we all make choices and we all choose paths. And we decide whether they work for us or not. And we get the feedback whether it was you know, quote, unquote, good or bad, right or wrong. Okay? There's, good, there's consequences for actions that can be positive or negative consequences depending on what choice you make. Um, Take back your power, no matter what happens to you, whether it's physical, emotional, neurological, um, sexual, whatever it is, whatever the trauma is, take back your power. Refuse to give the person or people who did something to you the power over you to determine your life. That's the way you can win in a trauma. That's the way you can say, no matter what happens to me on a daily basis, somehow I'm gonna take responsibility for what happened, right? Well, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, if I'm in a car accident, I chose to be there at that time. If I'm in a, in a place where I'm, I'm, I get jumped or if I'm sexually assaulted or whatever it is, 
I'm going to take responsibility for that. Not because I want to let them off the hook, but because I'm not going to live the rest of my life like a victim. Because then they get the best of me and I'm left to feeling like a hollow shell of a human being. So you choose, okay? You choose to be a victim or a survivor. You choose to make something out of your life based on what happens after that trauma versus what happens before that trauma. So just take that into consideration. Use these points as far as helping you process trauma, but understand ultimately the, la the only thing that matters is how you choose as you an individual what you're gonna do with the trauma, okay? So we're gonna leave it at that for now. Um, we're gonna sign off. Uh, obviously, hopefully you're outside in this beautiful weather. Obviously, it's amazing today. Yesterday was a bit sticky and hot, but uh, <laughs> today's amazing. So breathe in that fresh life. You know, obviously there's a lot of chaos in the world right now. People are very angry and they have every right to be, but what you do with that anger is really important. Focus your energy for the positive. Focus your energy on changing things. Focus your energy on people understand that we're all created equal. Treat people with respect, treat people with dignity. And for God's sake, don't be a victim of, of trauma. Don't be. Don't let someone get the better of you, okay? So we'll sign up for now. We'll see you on Friday for the uh, live Q&A. Send in your questions, info at sequoiahealth.com. Uh, call it in, 651-738-7800, rather. 651-738-7800, or the cell phone, text it in, 651-728-1390. Uh, and or DM us here, <laughs> send us a message on Insta or Facebook, and uh, we'll be happy to answer those questions. We're here to serve you. We're here to provide value for you and your loved ones. Let us, let us have that, that luxury of doing that. So we look forward to seeing you on Friday, and uh, we'll sign up for now. Have a great night, everybody.